Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for being here. Um, this is the last panel in our month long series, Trains, Techs and Tits, Sex Work, Technology and Movement. Um, this week, we are super excited to bring in Gabriela Garcia and Laura Lai Lee to finish us off, to really bring us up to the moment. Um, we started in the 1800s and we've come 200 years later. And now we're going to end on kind of the current moment of where we are now uh, and uh, hopefully talk a little bit about where we're going. So this is put on by Hacking Hustling, which is a collective of sex workers, survivors, and accomplices working at the intersection of technology and social justice to interrupt state surveillance and violence facilitated by technology. And uh, Gabrielle, do you want to, Gabriella, I'm sorry, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about this event? Um, yeah, sure. So um, Decoding Stigma um, is going to be hosting a sort of companion event this evening, um, kind of a decompression activity for anybody who wants to come. Uh, and it's basically just creating a little bit of a shared board of our own memories um, in, in the digital space as uh, sex workers and accomplices, um, because, you know, there's an attempt to erase this history and by erasing the history, it, it, it reinforces this kind of false narrative that it's only great man entrepreneurship that drives technology forward. And I think that anybody who's either a sex worker or an accomplice is actually part of this current history and technology whether or not you even are using um, digital mediation in order to perform or um, be active around it, because it's also the removal or the inability to access technology uh, that is equally important, if not more important in the circumstance. So this is just gonna be a chill day where we kind of make a little time capsule of the event and um, meet each other on a less uh, seminar level um, and, will be temporarily bound. So anything that you do, um, uh, you do add to the, the time capsule won't, will be deleted afterwards. Uh, we could discuss at the event whether we want to share it with each other as event participants, but otherwise, um, you know, I think that it's really important to be temporarily bound, not only for our own safety and privacy, but because it does honor this sort of like interstitial, which is, I think, you know, what I say is like where the sex worker feels most at home, which is the in-between or like the fantasy or this other space that is created for a short amount of time that doesn't exist on the other, uh, with, outside of the boundaries. Um, so yeah, I uh, hope I get to see some of you there. And can you say what you mean by temporarily bound? Ah, temporarily bound as in just, um, there won't be any recording and we won't be saving um, or um, putting out any of the results from this uh, hangout. And it's just gonna be, it's just gonna be within the construct of the event this evening. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, that sounds fantastic and like a great way to, to close this off. Um, oh. So today our agenda um, is gonna be, we're gonna do quick introductions and go through community agreements again. Um, what are we talking about this month and some context setting, and then we're gonna shift into questions for our panelists who are uh, brilliant and super excited to have in discussion with each other. So our community agreements, um, as they have been the last couple of weeks, bring in your histories and speak from your own experience. We recognize that everyone uh, has a unique experience to bring and uh, each of us knows something and together we know so much. Be committed to each other's collective learning and growing and we give grace and we give space to people to do that learning. Be open to learning yourself and recognize that our experiences are unique and diverse and they are also our experiences. We try not to share pirated work, including books, pornography, or other art forms without consent of the uh, creator, though I'll be honest, I did not ask Tom for this background, but I'm sure he's fine with it. Um, we respect the diversity of our identities, which for the purposes of this conversation means we are not assuming identities of our organizers, of our activists, um, and we are showing up in the way that feels most comfortable, most safe to have this conversation is in. And that means that we might not show up as sex workers, we might show up as organizers, we might show up as academics, we might show up as just curious folks, um, and we don't make assumptions about how folks show up. Um, we also uh, know dead naming and no doxing. So don't share personal information about another person without their consent. Uh, we prioritize care for ourselves and each other. It's two hours that we're sitting here. If your eyes hurt, if you wanna get up, if you wanna use the bathroom, no one's gonna be bothered by that. So please care for your body, care for your spirit and care for your heart. 
Um, we practice not using ableist language and we are all on a journey towards liberation. And we request that everyone prioritize taking care of yourself and taking care of each other as we share this space together. And today uh, we have two amazing presenters. We have Gabriela Garcia, who uses she, her pronouns, and you can find on Instagram and Twitter at um, and we have Lorelai Lee who uses they them pronouns and you can find Lorelai at Miss Lorelai Lee on Twitter. And so the context of this conversation is, uh, and we've been discussing this for the last couple of weeks, sex workers are early adopters who create space, who look for something new, who are pushed of other spaces and who find these new spaces and make them comfortable and make them desirable. And then when those spaces are comfortable and desirable and marketable and, and there's a, an ability to capitalize on what sex workers have built, um, shaping that space means that sex workers are then regulated and criminalized and policed out of those spaces. This has been true whether we, when we started talking about frontier towns in the 1800s or when we're talking about OnlyFans today. And so we started um, in trains, we started in newspapers, and we started with how sex workers really made the birth of an American nation possible. Um, and it also birthed the American sex trade as, as uh, we know it today. The sex trade has evolved over time and space throughout history. Um, commercial sex, ex the exchange of sexual services for resources is as old as time. And what we're talking about is really the modern American sex trade and where it came from. Next, we went into mid-century conversations about back pages, about magazines, about yellow tabloids, um, and about how gentrification in the development of cities uh, and, and the policing in the development of cities made um, created red light districts and created the way that we understand policing now. Last week, we really, uh, we were, I was just saying, we really, last week feels like part one of this week. Last week, we talked about the early internet and how sex workers built it, how sex workers were at the forefront of these conversations of what digital space could possibly be, and then what monetizing digital space could possibly be. Um, and then began to start talking about the criminalization, the policing that uh, so many of us are very deeply, intimately familiar with that have happened um, over the last 10 years. And so that's what we're doing today. And so just to kind of set the stage. So last week we talked a lot about the early internet. We started at DARPA um, and uh, moved into, you know, what at the beginning of the 2000s that looked like. And so we're gonna start at about that point and move up through today. So a couple contexts that just are important for this conversation is first, the context of visibility. Second, something we really didn't get into uh, in this series, but still is really important because as much as we're talking about digital space, sex workers are still physical beings and the regulation of the physical body remains a conversation. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about medical technology super quickly. We're gonna talk about uh, the context of technology and digital life. So what changed over the last 15, 20 years? Um, and then of course, digital regulation and trafficking expansion and the understanding of what trafficking was and the criminalization of trafficking um, really fueling this expansion. So sex worker visibility over the last, especially, you know, when, when we talked last time, we were seeing, we were discussing kind of some of the nascent organizations beginning really in the seventies and moving up through the nineties and the early two thousands. Um, but a lot of the organizations that we know today and that we participate in and have been organizers in really were forming at this time. And we were developing the, the political framework that a lot of us have now. St. James Infirmary is founded in 1999. I saw we have someone from St. James here. Um, SWAP, uh, the National SWAP, Swap, the first chapter uh, of Swap USA and December 17th happened in conjunction to each other in 2003. The first Desiree Alliance conference, the Desiree Alliance uh, was founded in 2005 by Stacey Swim and the first conference happened in 2006. And then the Global Network of Sex Worker Projects, which connected a lot of these global movements um, in, in different places in the world, came together in 2008. Um, and they actually have a really beautiful history um, of the global sex worker movement um, on their website. And so, of course, organizing means activism. And in a lot of ways, that means um, expanding direct services. And a lot of times when we, when we talk about the outreach that so many of us do about, you know, hanging out and connecting with other folks, we don't think about it as direct service. Um, but it still is that mutual aid that we do, that peer support. Um, was forming in these spaces. St. James Infirmary is a cooperatively led medical service organization. Um, SWAP uh, is uh, 
can be a political organization and an outreach organization, depending on the chapter. The Desiree Alliance Conference was about coming together through the lens of organizing and activism. And of course, that leads to sex workers um, demanding political change. And so Prop K goes on the ballot in San Francisco in 2008. A couple of years later, uh, a proposition very similar went through in Berkeley. It wasn't to necessarily decriminalize because that happens on a state level, but on a city level, you can do things um, like, uh, like defunding um, police efforts and, and defunding policing efforts around prostitution. And both of them actually come incredibly close to passing and build on each other. A couple of years later, Women with a Vision spearheads a lawsuit um, that was about uh, disparate impacts. So there were two different prostitution charges in the state of Louisiana, and the one with higher penalties was disproportionately uh, targeting street-based workers and black workers, whereas the one with lower penalties were more likely to be used towards white workers. And so in 2011, they win their lawsuit and end sex offender registration in Louisiana for people convicted of prostitution. Um, and women, and so, and also both of these, you know, when we're talking about what's going on today, both of these are spearheaded by organizations and by activists who are still working. Women with a Vision just introduced um, the first decriminalization bill in a Southern state and just two weeks ago had a hearing on the bill. Um, Prop K and, and the proposition in Berkeley are both uh, people on this call who were working on those campaigns. Um, and so this is a very important history. It's also a, a very recent history and that means it's still a really, really present history. And of course, visibility also means visibility as workers, you know, even though often it feels like we have to lead these dual lives of organizers versus workers, visibility complements both. And so as the internet became more accessible to people, as people moved onto the internet, things like Craigslist and Backpage, which treat sex work as a normal gig economy in a lot of ways, you know, both of them had adult services just listed along with other jobs. And that meant that people were looking for other jobs had to all of a sudden look at the sex industry too. And that normalization, that incorporation into a mainstream life meant that it it put the, the sex industry in a very visible place. So more sites are advertising sex work. And of course, nothing on the internet is regulated at this point. And honestly, still, like the regulations are internal and they're constantly changing. And so regulations on posts, what could be said and what couldn't be said was all still forming at the time. You're talking about websites that don't necessarily know the language of, of what means what. And so they're not gonna necessarily have regulations of like, oh, I know that that means something we don't want on our site. And so every single website either has no regulation or it's spotty and it's not super clear how they do it. And it's kind of half-assed how they implement it because it is incredibly difficult. Every website's exploring also how to monetize. And so sex workers are, are often leading this and finding these new avenues. Um, but the way that websites function um, is all of a sudden exploring something a little bit different than just selling a product on their site. At the same time, sex workers are also developing online presences in digital space that look a little different than how we typically understand them. And so I'm going to go into that in a second uh, later, but it means that sex workers are operating in spaces that do have those dual purposes. Sometimes it's sex workers on them. So, and now all of a sudden people are flooding into those spaces. And so what that means as far as advertising and personas also shifts and adapts. So when we've been talking a lot about like social technology, uh, technology in terms of like the internet, in terms of movement, one of the things we haven't necessarily talked about is how sex work has been also at the forefront of medical technology and medical exploration during this entire period. So since we didn't talk about that, it could be a whole four week workshop as well. So super quickly, of course, sex workers are viewed, when we're talking about the early 1900s, sex workers are victims, sex workers are in need of saving. This is the development of the trafficking uh, narrative, where turning sex workers into people who require you to go in and pull them out is really important. At the same time as in the early 1900s and in the late 1800s that we focused a lot on, this was also the time where different types of industries and different interventions were being developed. So temperance and purity movements, we're seeing this, we're seeing poverty shifting, movement, urbanization means that poverty is not only present in a lot of, in the face of a lot of people who have means, it also shows up in a really different way. It's really different to have rural poverty in Iowa and the Rockefellers in New York, but all of a sudden, if you move to five points, the Rockefellers have to see poverty 
And so that proximity and that shifting of class really uh, catalyzes um, a lot of these, uh, these uh, purity and temperance movements to also consider poverty itself as a, as, as a, um, a confrontation to their idea of temperance and purity. And so they incorporate a lot of these savior narratives into the work that they do. Um, not only are they advocating on a legislative le level for increased policing of both alcohol and prostitution, they're also developing um, ways that they can directly go in and save people. And so because a lot of this is being done by the developing middle class and by women who have are regulated out of jobs, don't necessarily want jobs anyway, all of a sudden what happens is the very uh, initial seeds of what becomes eventually the social work profession begins. And so you have women from upper class um, backgrounds who are all of a sudden seeing migrants, who are seeing internal migrants, who are seeing poverty, who want to do something but have an understanding of the world that poverty is also a moral issue. And so the idea of going in, of saving people eventually turns into a, a profession we now call social work. Second, uh, we're seeing a lot of medical in, uh, advancements at this time and an investment in what is called public health. And so a lot of these temperance and purity movements are very interconnected to these public health movements. Um, and you know, we know that the conditions that people are living in and that people are working in are having negative consequences on, on their health. When you have 10 people in a really crowded one bedroom apartment, that is compromising people's health. But once again, those things are inextricable from each other when they're looked at through this lens of poverty, purity, and temperance, all coming together and all with the resources to develop um, things like vigilance associations. And so the early part of, the, the, of this history is about the moralization of poverty. It's about the development of social work. And at the same time, it's really about uh, the development of industries that see sex workers as objects to be acted upon. So this, um, after about the 1920s, what you see is this idea of sex workers not as victims, but increasingly as vectors of disease, as criminalization increases, as policing increases, um, you know, you're, they're starting to realize that like people aren't victims, that sex workers are going to continue to, to make ends meet, especially because the answer to these things is not better jobs. The answer is saviorism. And so because they're not offering structural inequity, uh, it, they're not offering solutions that address structural inequity, sex workers lose that kind of victimhood. Um, and so at the same time, what's happening is an incredible investment in the American military. You're seeing at the end of the 1920s, World War, uh, World War I, and a, a little bit later, World War II. And so there's a huge investment um, from what is now the Department of Defense into infrastructure and, and into this idea of how do we create better soldiers? It's very much still focused on a huge Genesis movement. Early public health was a eugenicist movement. And so wrapped up in this is this sense of war, is this sense of global war that's happening. The first, it's considered the first world war. And it's at the same time that this American narrative of saviorism is becoming our American story. And so sex workers are increasingly seen as vectors of disease. And, uh, and so what happens is through the Department of Defense budget and actually through a public health association funded by the Rockefellers, there's an incredible investment in policing specific to bases uh, that are located throughout the country. And what happens is the DOD says, all right, we have all these medical advancements, especially around STIs. And so what happens is the DOD says, all right, if we want to create a super soldier, if we want to create the perfect American soldier, we need to protect them. And we know that these men are going out and they're seeing escorts and, and they're going to brothels because brothels are popping up around these forts and around these military bases. And so what the DOD does is start increasing policing and criminalization of what they consider lewd women um, around bases. And it was specifically to take these, uh, take these women, um, forcibly incarcerate them, sometimes without even being charged, and holding them while they test out these brand new STI uh, uh, medications, vaccines, all sorts of things really focused on sexual health because they think if we remove these women or if we at least treat them for STIs under these brand new medications that we have, 
it's going to be better for our soldiers if they do go see uh, sex workers. And so that actually from about the 1920s to the 1970s, the DOD is one of the biggest investors in policing of sex workers and in forcible incarceration and forcible medical practices of sex workers in the United States. And that goes up through the 70s. And so what we see is through this history, this idea that sex workers are vectors of disease alongside the development of public health. Um, the creation of these vaccines, of these treatments is happening at the same time that they are testing a lot of these things on um, what they consider lewd women because that, that's what the public health approach is to uh, um, things like gonorrhea and syphilis, um, forcible testing upon, uh, upon arrest and then forcible medication during, peri during long periods of incarceration. Um, and so how we see this manifest, especially later on is, um, and especially after uh, the HIV crisis and what public health is kind of turning into is, and I'm gonna uh, toss it over to Lorelai to kind of talk through this, is an increase in this idea of like sex triggers as vectors of disease. And even though we're talking about digital space, we're still looking at, especially through a public health lens that is married to a carceral approach, um, the uh, the use of condoms becoming weaponized. And so I'm actually gonna ask Lola to tell us a little bit about that specific to porn. Yeah, so um, Kate, thank you so much for this comprehensive history. It's so, so good. And I love how you're tying all of these pieces together into one narrative, which is like really hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just thinking like, oh, can I uh, connect this super deeply to what you've just described already? Um, and I'm not sure that I can. Um, but I, one thing, and I know you were going to ask us about additional points, and I was thinking about the um, purity campaigns that you're describing. And something I think is really interesting is how in the early 1900s, um, feminist purity campaigns were also really tied to prohibition and how it was a it was a response to the narrative that sex workers were uh, you know e that femininity feminine sexuality was itself you know sinful evil temp tempting and that women were the ones who were responsible for men's sort of like downfall so the feminist response was oh no actually they're the victims of male uh, lust and so that's how it was tied to alcoholism it was like transforming the narrative to actually men are the ones who are being weak who are drinking too much and that was tied to domestic abuse which was also sort of becoming an issue at the time right um, and how that continues into the military uh, interventions as well where they tie sex work and alcohol together um, so the this this period now jumping ahead a hundred years um, <laughs> is just, uh, so the condom battles in California um, was, was sort of one of my uh, origin points of organizing. Um, although I was certainly politically active before then, I hadn't really organized my own sort of, um, you know, I had showed up for things, but I hadn't necessarily done the organizing myself. And that's what happened for me after Measure B passed. So in 2012, uh, Los Angeles County passed Measure B, which was a requirement that on any set uh, in Los Angeles County um, that was filming adult films, you had to use condoms. And the enforcement was tied to um, uh, film permits. So when you got your film permit, you registered where you were going to shoot, and that would be how they would enforce. They would show up randomly on set uh, in order to see whether condoms were being used there or not. In 2013, um, due to a lawsuit, they found that this um, visiting of sets was a, for a Fourth Amendment violation um, because as many of you probably know, I know there's a lot of folks in the audience with a lot of deep knowledge about this, um, adult film is often shot in people's homes. I mean, like 90% of the time. Um, in fact, I think that's even more so now. Um, but so they said you could, you can't, the enforcement mechanism is taken out. However, uh, after Measure B passed, there were still significant impacts. One uh, was that there was something like a 
95%, I used to know the exact statistic, uh, reduction in applications for adult film permits. Um, and another was that, uh, and more impactful for performers, was that we were told when shooting in LA that we couldn't tweet, we couldn't post about what we were shooting, when we were shooting, we couldn't tell who we were working for online. They didn't want us to do any documenting of our work. And I think um, something that's important to recognize is that people think of pornography as being a legal adult industry. And um, I think it's important to recognize that what it is is a legalized industry. When we talk about the four models of regulating um, sex work, uh, I won't go into detail about that, but um, decriminalization being what we are, <laughs> what we're often talking about and pushing for, and legalization being a form um, of in which uh, some kinds of do doing the work are legal. However, there are so many regulations that um, there is a shadow industry that is still criminalized. And so that's what happened after Measure B, that sort of shadow industry got bigger and sort of encompassed most of adult film. And so we knew that that was the impact of Measure B after Measure B passed. So then, um, in 2014, um, AB 1576 is actually the number, was um, introduced in Cal California, um, I don't know, House or Senate, anyway, in the California State Legislature. And uh, that bill was going to be a statewide condom regulation as well as a testing requirement. And so it was going to require that uh, adult performers both use condoms on set and be tested for HIV only. It, this I'm telling you all of this from memory, so it's been seven years, so I, I apologize, I didn't look it up. Um, but from my memory, it was HIV only. And this part I'm sure about because it was a really important part of the campaign, it was only going to require ELISA tests. So those of you who are familiar with HIV testing, the ELISA test has a three month window between um, HIV transmission and showing a positive test result. The uh, test that we were already using in the industry um, was a PCR DNA test or um, RNA test, which I know folks are now familiar with because of COVID, but it tests for the presence of the virus in your blood. And so it has a two, you know, um, at that time it was a 10 day window. It got shorter, seven days at the outset. Um, and so we were upset both about the fact that this was going to decrease in our minds the um, level of protection that we would have on set, of health protections that we would have on set. It was going to decrease our ability to choose um, among where we might work. I mean, you know, this idea of choice is complicated, but um, it had no nothing in there about us being able to choose how we would pr uh, protect our own health. And then the third thing was that it was going to require the state to hold our medical information. So it was in essence going to require a registry of adult film performers. Um, and so that's terrifying for um, folks who work in a really stigmatized industry and it would have had our, our legal names uh, there as well. Um, and so then we did defeat that by showing up at hearing after hearing, by going to legislators' offices and uh, talking to them. And in fact, many of the legislators I talked to, and I think this ties back to what Kate is, is talking about, um, the things that they were concerned about were so telling. Uh, I had one legislator say to me, oh, well, you seem smart, but they're not all like you. Uh, so that really deeply goes back to this 1900s uh, sort of impression. And also, I mean, I think is also an assessment of my whiteness, uh, very, very much like in coming from the 1900s, um, sex workers, particularly of Asian descent, were viewed as inherently victims. Um, and that is still true today in the enforcement of trafficking uh, laws. So. Another uh, legislator told me that if, if there wasn't a law requiring condoms in porn, what was he going to say to his teenage son about safer sex? So he, so many problems there, right? Um, but just the idea that you can control the social body by regulating sex workers, I think is deeply tied into this history. Um, yeah, exactly, Kate. <laughs>
Um, so we did defeat that. And then um, there was an ocean re OSHA regulation that had been in, proce in process for 10 years by the time it reached the hearing stage in 2016. They were about to pass it. That regulation included a condom requirement as well as PPE requirements. Now everybody knows what PPE is because of COVID, but personal protection equipment. Um, and so it wasn't clear from the regulation what kind of personal protective equipment would be required, except that it said it would be required anytime there was the possible transmission of bodily fluids. So, um, you know, we weren't sure if that meant covering our faces, you know, wearing gloves, which like gloves are hot sometimes, you know, latex gloves, but I don't want to wear them all the time. Uh, and I don't want the state telling me when I have to wear them more to the point. Um, and then it also, the OSHA regulation also would have had that testing requirement and that state uh, held information. So that was defeated at a hearing where hundreds of us showed up. Um, folks drove four, five hours from LA to Oakland in order to be there. Folks flew from other states where they were living, folks who were working in adult film in California, but living in other states. And we uh, gave testimony for eight hours and they were prepared to pass it. And at the end of that day, they didn't because of our argument that workers should be involved in writing this regulation. It seems so obvious, um, but that was that was truly an incredible uh, moment and we all cried a lot. But then there was a ballot measure. <laughs> the ballot measure, again, was a condom requirement and also included something that we've been seeing more and more in regulation over the last 20 years, which is a civil enforcement provision allowing citizens, if they see something, uh, to see something, say something, right? Uh, to bring a lawsuit, and so the the what it said was that if if California citizens had watched an adult film in which their condoms were not visible, they could bring a lawsuit in order to enforce the law. It also would have allowed if the attorney general didn't enforce the law, um, the attorney general of California to whatever certain degree, it allowed the head of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, who was actually the one behind all of these um, different, Measure B, all of these different pieces, um, allowed him to step in as this sort of surrogate uh, AG in order to enforce the law, and he wouldn't have been able to be removed from that position except for by a two-thirds vote of the legislature, which is like, bananas. Um, so <laughs> that gratefully we uh, did, you know, we got, we did a lot of canvassing and et cetera. And that one also did not pass in the 2016 election. However, we didn't get to celebrate because Donald Trump was elected president. Um, so that, that story. <laughs> Thank you. And, you know, I think one of the other things that has come up over and over again, but in slightly quieter ways, is this pairing of criminal enforcement and allowing civil procedures. So criminal enforcement can only happen by an agent of the government. Civil procedures can be brought by anyone. So citizens, etc. And actually, this is a very common thing that we see in the history of sex work regulation, whether we're starting in the 1920s, where they would pass criminals, they would criminalize brothels and then get mad at the police for not enforcing them, they passed then what was called red light abatement laws where citizens could sue brothels to say you're bringing down my property value. And that's what they actually use to begin zoning brothels out. As we're seeing here, inclusion of a civil uh, piece where, you know, everyone gets deputized to attack the sex industry. And then eventually we're going to get into FOSTA-SESTA, where initially they brought a criminal uh, piece around this, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and when that did not work out, because the Department of Justice was like, I, we actually don't have a huge interest in taking down Backpage. They passed uh, SESTA, which is a civil procedure that anyone can bring charges, uh, anyone can bring civil enforcement against these companies. And so uh, one of the other ways that condom shows up and what makes public health really complicated is that it has this yes and it's a both kind of situation where it can be weaponized and it can be really helpful. So the other way that we're seeing at the exact same time condoms hopping, popping up is in condoms being used in policing. So uh, condoms as evidence is something a lot of us know where it's uh, trying to ban the practice of condoms being used as evidence of prostitution. And it's catalyzed a lot of organizing across the country. In about 2010, the New York Condoms as Evidence Coalition uh, is formed. In 2012, San Francisco, based on advocacy happening, especially at St. James Infirmary, bans the use of condoms in policing. In 2013, D.C. police start handing out cards that say it is legal to carry condoms specifically to workers to confront the myth that uh, 
sort of myth that they'll arrest you for condoms. And really that campaign is just as much about MPD as it is to sex workers. And at the same time, global health is finally standing up for the rights of sex workers and against criminalization. A UN AIDS guidance note uh, comes out in 2009, which says that decriminalization is uh, important for sex workers' health and safety. In 2015, the Lancet series is published and remains one of the most important public health documents, which says that decriminalization of the sex industry could reduce the transmission of HIV AIDS globally uh, 33 to 41% over 10 years. So at the same time, we're going back now to the technology that we all kind of think of. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at digital saturation. Um, we've invented the internet and around 2002, 2004, it begins uh, becoming ubiquitous in the way that we understand it now. Um, expansion of 3G in 2002 and then 4G in 2010 and the saturation of smartphones being used um, and being owned has a lot of impacts on the sex industry. It's easier for clients who all of a sudden have their own personal computer who their wives and their children do not also have access to. Um, and they can download faster. They can visit websites faster. Websites can have different types of content on there. For workers, it's easier to post ads. Um, it's easier to post content. And then of course, all of a sudden we have selfies. So we're not relying on manual and we're not relying on photographers to construct and then post our ads. It gives an entirely different level of independence for what working can be. And at the same time, the other technology, so we have the internet, but social media is its own thing. Social media is a very different form of the internet that we've had before. So, and this is also happening at the very beginning of the 2000s. So Facebook goes live in 2004 and expands, um, or Facebook goes live and beyond the Ivy League schools in 2004. Um, it opens to a certain number of colleges you have, and, be, and then a year after that, it opens up to everyone with an EDU address. And around that time, only 5% of American adults social media and now it's up to over 72 percent and now and that was pre-pandemic so this number is significantly higher now in 2006 myspace is the most visited website on the internet and we think about myspace a lot as you know the the place where social media really began where connecting. I, I mean, granted, I'm sure I'm sure there's a swath of us who are on Friendster as well, but MySpace is really about creating your own profile, connecting to other people, and really developing the social network. Reddit comes up in 2005, Twitter launches in 2006, and Instagram launches in 2010. And so, of course, immediately, we're, now we have people on the internet who have have a reason to be on the internet that is different than uh, they did before. All of a sudden, social media gives a new avenue and a new audience and a new reason to exist in digital space and in a significantly different way, in a very personal way. So of course, then we're going to start talking about digital regulation. As different folks get on the internet, different uh, we have to think, we people begin uh, noticing the internet in a different way and, and definitely noticing who is on the internet in a different way. So last time we talked about the communication and Decency Act, which came up in 2000, uh, in, sorry, 1996, and created Section 230, which says that internet platforms are not legally responsible for what gets posted on their site. And this is important and would not have, uh, without this, there would be no social media because people would be legally responsible for the shit that gets said on their site. Um, under Bush one, where uh, there was a lot of attempt to enforce obscenity, and when it moves into Clinton in 1992, that kind of shifts. So the DOJ was really trying to use obscenity law at the time to look at the internet and apply the same standards. But of course, obscenity law is determined in a very geographic way, according to the Supreme Court at that time. And so no one really knows how to tackle it. And so it begins where they're talking about obscenity, talking about obscene things in pornography. And under Clinton, this really shifts. And the, there's a decision made to no longer really go after just like straight up porn, but to really focus on pornography that involves minors with the idea that if you're a minor involved in pornography, there's harm being done. And so the DOJ really makes a, a significant decision under Janet Reno to shift. One of the people who leaves there is, um, uh, uh, we talked about him last time, um, and he's one of the lawyers there. He works under William Barr uh, and eventually goes on to run what we now know as Inkosi, but what back then was known as morality in the media, which targeted all pornography and anything gay. Um, and 
players become a little bit different. We were talking about the DOJ before, but it's actually states attorneys generals who are going after online ads. And I think some of these names you might recognize. So in 2010, the Connecticut Attorney General, Senator, uh, who is now Senator Blumenthal, sends a letter to Craigslist over, sex, over having sex work ads and really starts threatening those websites directly. Um, in 2013, many attorneys generals, uh, this is spearheaded by uh, A.G. Blumenthal, but includes uh, California's Attorney General Kamala Harris. They send a letter to Congress specifically about Backpage and 230. At this point, Craigslist had closed their adult services section and Backpage had taken a lot of that traffic. And so in 2013, they start targeting that website. In 2016, uh, at that time, A.G. Harris has the Backpage CEO arrested, um, not just once for promotion of prostitution. After those charges are dismissed, she uh, decides to charge him again with slightly different facts, and both of those are end up being dismissed. And as you know, Kamala Harris goes on to being the senator from California and eventually being our current vice president. And this is also the same time that we're seeing a ramp up in the targeting specifically of websites, not just of brothels, not just of madams, how we'd seen before, but specifically websites. And the first one is in 2014 when myredbook.com uh, was seized and its owners were arrested for facilitation of prostitution and money laundering. It's also the first time you're seeing trafficking really come up as the reason behind this. And this was uh, federal. It was the, the Federal Department of Justice uh, came in to seize this website. Only a year and a half later, we see rentboy.com get seized by not this time DOJ, but Department of Homeland Security. Once again, you're seeing uh, claims of violence and exploitation. And ultimately, uh, uh, the owner and seven employees, the charges were dropped against the employees, but the owner is charged with facilitation of prostitution and money laundering. Lastly, in 2018, as many of us remember, Backpage is then seized. And once again, its owners and its CEO uh, are charged with facilitation and, uh, of prostitution and money laundering. Missing from every single one of these charges is anything actually to do with trafficking. And we're also seeing legislation happen at this exact same period. Um, a lot of folks don't realize in 2015, they actually started trying to put this in federal trafficking legislation to criminalize websites directly. What happens is this bill passes that adds both advertising and actually at this and also adds patronizing and soliciting to uh, the federal definition of trafficking. Um, specifically for the sex industry. And so it adds advertising and that gets pinged over to the Department of Justice who says, you know what, we actually don't think we can make a trafficking case against Backpage, sorry. So we are gonna interpret this to say, this definition is specific to if you post an ad for someone that you know is a minor or you know is a trafficking victim, that's what we define this as. And Congress is pissed and everyone who backed it was pissed off as well. And once again, they're saying you're not doing enough to enforce these criminal laws. Therefore, we have to take a different tactic. So in response, SESTA is proposed um, and drafted and introduced by Senator by now Senator Blumenthal. Um, and what it does is create civil liability for advertisers with the threat that anyone and everyone is going to file a charge. Um, in the course of that, one of the things that the tech companies do is decide they don't want civil liability for websites that is super broad. And so it's actually the tech companies that come in and say, how about this as an exchange? Let's just expand the White Slave Traffic Act to say that everyone who uses the internet is now facilitating prostitution crossing state lines. And it's prostitution, it's not trafficking. What happens in the end is the unholy marriage of both of these bills, where one had passed through the Senate, one had passed through the House, and in the end, they are joined to create what we now know as FOSTA-SESTA. And so with that, um, we're going to shift over to talk to our panelists. Um, and uh, first and foremost, um, and we didn't talk about order, so whoever wants to answer first, what context would you add to this? What, uh, you know, this was a lot of context and what's missing here and what framings are you guys bringing to this conversation um, that you think it's really important to share? I'll, I'll add like one bit of context. And I think that is sort of the inter, the collision of the ubiquity of cell phones and the creation of, um, terms of service and, sure. and definitions of harm. And so like, you know, the iPhone is one of those things that really exacerbates um, access to the internet and also kind of puts this sort of like media making object into everyone's, uh, into everyone's pocket. But part of that is that uh, Apple had created a very, very strict idea of what inappropriate content means and what that includes. Um, and it was defined um, by this like, it was defined at the moment of internet ubiquity. So 
but so in their terms of service to be able to access and like put anything into the app store, they prohibited explicit content uh, from third party app developers. Um, and basically decided that from the very beginning of like internet ubiquity, that sexuality was equal to objectionable or like harmful content, um, which they defined as something that threatened the safety of their product's users. So there's this conflation of sexuality and like safety. Um, and of course, like this doesn't really actually stop people from finding ways to communicate to potential victims, or it doesn't curb the use of violent sexual rhetoric. Cause you know, really it's like people that want to do harm don't really care about terms and conditions. Um, so basically I think one of the things that really contextualizes this conversation is like, um, as more people are accessing the internet, they're, they're accessing it through um, mobile app development and app platforms like the Facebook app. So just as a business model from the very beginning, in order to be in the marketplace as, uh, as an internet or digital business, you, your biggest audience at the beginning was through the app store. So just from that point on, it means that all platforms were starting to try to adhere to a definition of objectable, objectifiable, <laughs> excuse me, objectionable content. Um, and I think that's just like a seed that's just uh, overlooked a lot in, in, in planting like what it really meant to start participating in internet ubiquity um, that didn't necessarily exist so universally. Um, so that's just one thing that I wanted to add to the conversation. Yeah, um, that's such a good point. And I am thinking about how what something else that we're talking about is the sort of um, transformation of the public conversation over the last 40 years from being about uh, being harmed by viewing something versus the internet as a place where direct violence is happening. Um, so, you know, you have the porn wars in the 80s and 90s, in which uh, sometimes it's called the sex wars or the feminist sex wars, um, in which you have these, you know, different factions of feminist movements um, and you, we develop the idea of sort of sex positivity in response to the um, other to the other more perhaps more dominant uh, feminist ideology um, that says that sexuality I mean uh, it's sort of like complicated to sort of describe what it says I there's a reductionist reading of Catherine McKinnon that says that all heterosexual sex is rape right but that's not exactly what she was saying what she says is that um, it is whenever we give consent within heteropatriarchy to uh, heterosexual sex, if, if we are women, I don't know, assigned female at birth, she doesn't make those discern discernations, uh, that we are doing so within a power structure where we have less power. And so that constricts our ability to consent. I actually think that's true. And I think that it was a really remarkable insight. I think where she took it and it's sort of the application was where it all goes wrong. But uh, <laughs> there's, so then there's this fight about that among feminists. And then I think um, in the legal systems, you can see this playing out. And uh, I mean, there's other, someone put Lisa Dugan's book in the chat. There's also Pleasure and Danger, uh, which is Carol Vance edited, which is um, papers from the Barnard Sex Conference um, that has a lot about this topic. And then you get into the 90s and you have uh, more feminists moving into government and into legal positions. And then you get what is now being called governance feminism, where um, folks who sort of identify as subjugated gain a lot of power. And so they're still operating from a place of self-identification as subjugated while in positions of power. And so using tools of power like criminal law um, and tools of governance and social control as though they're still operating from a subjugated position as though those tools can be wielded on behalf of subjugated people rather than being simply tools of subjugation and tools of oppression. And so in the 90s, you have this sort of um, 
all in the, you know, and some in the 80s. I mean, there's like the Minneapolis uh, ordinance that start, tries to make pornography um, get provide a civil claim, claiming that pornography is a human rights violation. Um, and then in the 90s, you have what Kate was describing in terms of um, the you know, origins of Section 230. Uh, now the name is just like gone out of my head. Uh, the CDA. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and um, this idea that pornography is like the biggest threat on the internet. And that transforms around the time that we are starting today's timeline around 2008, Obama's election, which is actually a really significant um, transition because under Bush two, you still had a federal FBI task force on obscenity and in fact three films that I performed in uh, were the subject of an indictment under that uh, obscenity task force. Uh, so an FBI agent ordered my films uh, from Washington DC. I mean, and I think this is also sort of very deeply what we were talking about, how enforcement happens has changed so much. Uh, it had to be a physical object that was sent across state lines and that's what made it a federal crime and then his watching it watching all three of these films in dc then allowed them to bring the uh, prosecution in dc and it did go to trial that was um uh, U.S. versus Stagliano, uh, if anyone wants to look at it, and I was called as a witness in that case, uh, but the prosecutor fucked up so tremendously. In fact, the prosecutor couldn't operate the DVD in the courtroom after having two years of preparation, this was in 2010, uh, that the judge got so angry that he um, throughout the case after the prosecution had presented. So the defense never presented. So I was not, I didn't have to take the witness stand, thankfully, because there was some dispute about whether I would have to reveal my legal name. But um, that judge who made that decision is actually the same judge who heard the FOSTA challenge uh, over the last couple of years. So, uh, and I can't remember when he made that decision, 2019, I think maybe the first FOSTA decision. Um, so anyway, that's just a bit of trivia. Um, and I think that progression is part of part of what we're talking about, that the move was from pornography to trafficking um, as being the primary harm of sex on the internet. And Save the Children from Pornography stopped having the moral sway that it had in the 80s and 90s. Um, and I think, you know, you can just see how this moves. It's like homosexuality in the 70s and 80s is the threat to children. In the 80s and 90s, it's pornography. From the late 90s moving into the uh, 2000s, and especially now, trafficking becomes the source, uh, the, the fault for everything that harms children on the internet. Um, so. I just want to piggyback a little bit off of that and, and thinking about the physical, like how it had to be a physical object that needed to be moved uh, as part of like creating the legislation around that, that I think it's like really no surprise that, you know, FOSTA has become an extension of the Mann Act. And like, so it extended um, the Mann Act to, let's see, what does it say? Uh, a federal crime prohibiting the owning, operating, or managing of an interactive computer service, such as a website with the intent to promote or facilitate prostitution. So in this way, you see how legislation turns the digital into a physical space, like it materializes something that had historically been seen as a part, like, oh, digital is gonna kill the book industry, like, cause like everyone's gonna be reading, like they're gonna give up on the physical um, idea, idea. And I think that, you know, you know, by changing something that prosecuted movement of bodies through space, it like, um, it kind of, the legislation bent to materialize interactive computer services as vehicles capable of transport um, and that's just something I think that reflects something that um, sex workers and accomplices have always known that what occurs on the internet does not actually stay on the internet and that like there is really no digital physical um, binary and something I'll talk about a little bit later is the fact that like, you know, the deconstruction of binary occurs like really uh, at its height through 
um, discussions of sex work and participation in sex work, I think. So many of those themes are so relevant and so important uh, to kind of pull on it. Yeah, I, the, that binary of like digital, physical, not necessarily um, uh, being relevant or being real and how much sex workers know the manifestations of digital things in in people's real lives and and understanding that um and uh you know talking about fosta and how yeah it expanded the man act which was this very like physical space moving from one area to another and uh the how in uh the expansion of FOSTA was about like, all right, movement across state lines is now the existence of the internet and, and it's constantly crossing state lines. There is no uh, movement necessary because we are always in, in movement when we are in digital space. And actually, um, so the original draft of FOSTA when it came down um, or when FOSTA was proposed, um, <clears throat> sorry, from these tech companies, actually included users as well. And it was anyone who also used the internet. And so they had, because it was written by tech companies who didn't really understand, it was written uh, to also, so anyone who advertised themselves um, would have been caught up uh, by FOSTA if it had initially passed. And the thing was, it was edited by people who still didn't understand how sex work happens. And they were very, very proud. I actually got a phone call from one of them that was like, we pulled the users out. So it's just website owners. And I was like, I'm an organizer who runs a listserv where people share information. Do you realize what you just did? And they, and literally no one had considered the fact that sex workers advertise together that they organize in, in digital space and so had thought that they had made this great thing without realizing that what they had done was turn every single organizer into a federal felon. And so that kind of goes into my next question was that with something we had talked about was, you know, yes, this is about sex workers as workers, sex workers as advocates. Um, and one of the things that I think it was Lorelai, you were talking about um, folks uh, connecting to current sex workers who are future sex workers who could use these spaces. How does, how does the internet, how does the development of social media um, impact those inner community conversations and how does policing change what those conversations could possibly look like? Yeah, um, well, <laughs> there are big, big answers to all of these questions. So just know that if you see like my face go pale, it's because I'm like, ah, it's a book, it's a book. Um, <laughs> no, uh, there's a couple of things. Okay, so first, before I answer that question, I wanted to also mention how FOSTA, uh, one thing about FOSTA that I found really terrifying is when we were doing the research for um, FOSTA in a legal context, which is the legal explainer that we wrote, um, uh, Kendra Albert and I and a bunch of other folks um, for Hacking Hustling, is um, is that in the man in the White Slave Traffic Act, Man Act cases, uh, you go back and it gets expanded and expanded and expanded. And one of the expansions is a prosecution of a woman for transporting herself across state lines in order to work in a brothel. Uh, and the court says that even though the law is written in such a way that it would seem to exclude transportation of oneself, that you would have to include that. So as to, uh, what does he say? Something like, oh shit. See, I always do this lead up. It's a great line and now I've forgotten the line, but it's something about like to avoid uh, missing the evil that was intended to be targeted by the law, the extent of the evil or something. So, you know, when I read that and I was thinking about how, um, you know, the initial FOSTA case dismisses uh, the challenge to it saying that organizers won't be targeted because the DOJ says they won't target organizers. Uh, sex workers won't be targeted because the DOJ says they won't be targeted, not because it says that in the law, not because the law is written narrowly, but because the current DOJ says they won't do it. Um, as though that can't change in 20 years, you know, so that is terrifying. Um, but to answer, I'm sorry, to go back and answer your question. Um, <laughs> I, so I, 
sort of just to give context to this, I started doing sex work in 2000. I feel like people have heard me say this a million times. Uh, you know, the turn of the century, the dawn of the internet. Uh, <laughs> if you saw, I, I saw that I was cited by Tina Horn when we talked about like who has VHS tapes of their pornography. Uh, hi. Um, and uh, Oh boy. And in that time, I was not online. I was very much not online. Gratefully, I moved to San Francisco in 2001. And so in those very early years, some of the um, activist work that Kate was talking about was really happening in San Francisco. But the only way that I knew about it was bookstores and like flyers, uh, be, you know, flyers at St. James Infirmary, flyers on the wall of the queer club, you know, like um, at flyers at the queer bookstore, which doesn't exist anymore, of course. Um, and so I would go to these like meetings or, um, you know, there was like a sex worker university in 2005 in San Francisco. It was the best. I mean, it was the best. Or even for me, a big piece of what really like radicalized me and thank you so much to the person who's here from St. James is being at St. James Infirmary where they had, uh, you know, I had no health insurance and they had drop-in days on Wednesday night and you could just go there and you like even if you didn't want to see a doctor you would go and you would check in and you would hang out in the community room where there was like um, a clothing exchange and there was a hot meal and there was students from the acupuncture school doing ear acupuncture and it was so amazing and like um the the just being in that room like I remember I was so scared to talk to anybody you know I felt really really alone in those early years of doing sex work I mean I just started answering ads on the internet because I was injured from a minimum wage job and also was just not making enough money to survive and I just like one day quit my and during the day that I quit I went into the back room and started circling ads in the back physical back pages of the newspaper and I'm making this story too long of course but the point is is that I, I think not unlike many others felt very isolated and had to have in-person interactions in order to understand that sex work as an identity, that sex work stigma was a thing, that it, my shame, my feelings of shame, my feelings of um, being alone and deserving to be alone, deserving to be punished, of impending punishment, like that this, I was gonna get HIV because that's what happens to whores, you know, I was gonna get killed by a client because that's what happens to whores, that these were not um, realities, that these were, uh, you know, constructions. In order to learn that I had to be somewhere like San Francisco that had a very unique space like St. James Infirmary where you could show up and get your life saved. And the thing is, after 2008, that radically changed. So in 2014, this is an example, when the uh, condom bills started going through uh, California and this series of condoms, condom battles started happening, and I heard about it. Um, and the way I heard about it was that I actually heard um, someone say, oh, we need performers to go talk to legislators. And I just can't get any. The person who said this was not a performer. They were, I don't remember who they were, somebody who worked for a porn company or something. And I was like, oh, well, I know performers. And like, I'm really pissed off about this law. Uh, why don't I just DM some people on Twitter? Like, I don't even have to have people's phone numbers. Like, these are just people who I've had sex with for money on camera. And that's like, actually the only relationship I had with a lot of them. And yet, and we like never talked about politics. And yet we could go on Twitter and we could organize a fucking movement and stop a bill from passing. So I wanted like not, there's so much more that I could say. And actually I should add one more piece to this, which is that though that was the difference that I was thinking about when I, when Kate and I first started really working together uh, it, in Survivors Against SESTA, when um, the SESTA FOSTA started passing, started moving rather. Um, and I was just thinking about how uh, hard it is to find community, to find uh, any kind of positive messaging, to like 
re have resilience against isolation. In 2017, six porn performers committed suicide. And right after that, FOSTA started moving. And I was just thinking about how hard it is as a sex worker to find any kind of community support and how much harder it would be after FOSTA. Uh, and so that is, I, I feel like that is the big change now that we have this crackdown on internet uh, interactions. And that's a change to organizing that we've all had to work around. I'm gonna just do this real quick. <laughs> um because yeah i mean as as like comments are saying it's like wow that is it is it is such a true and a necessary account and like i i come a few years like after you like i i come in the cusp of like coming from gig work in general like i um initially i came to craigslist because i was an actor and i was a model and then like these things started popping up and i was just like oh um but there are two things I want to say in that, in that, like, when I first started, like, participating in, like, trade, um, it was basically for, like, personal collection, like, personal picture, like, pick collectors, basically. And for me, that wasn't really something that I thought about as sex work. And that's something that I think is, like, in, like consistently important in the discussion around sex work is that, like, how much of it is not necessarily identifying as a sex worker, um, but, you know, being involved in, you know, trades around sex occurred because of like the adjacency to information. Um, and both being able to like really have this like liminal space of, you know, being in college and definitely not making enough money to uh, participate in what college was supposed to be in New York City and being able to say like, oh, I'm just going for this casting. Like I'm just going for, you know, a test shoot and then coming back without a job was like such a regular conversation, like that it it was fine for me to not have results of my work. And that was something that was like very, very special about being able to participate that way. Um, but what brought me really forth was this access to, um, yeah, other people's experiences, usually through the blogosphere. Um, so 2007 is really like the height of when things like um, confessions of a college call girl are coming out. And suddenly I really see myself in these narratives that are being not only, um, not only just present for me to read, but promoted. And one of the things that really brought me toward um, feeling uh, safe in, in participating was these very personal accounts of complicated situations. And I think there's something that really gets reduced in the conversation that it is complicated, that like uh, there are complicated problems that only within the realm of sex work have complicated solutions, at least up at, like at that point of me beginning to participate, which is like 2007. Um, and there was something about the camaraderie from afar that was really, really necessary for me to see that this was a private space that intersected with a public reality that I wanted to explore as like a very, very broke person and an artist trying to go to a very, very good college in New York City, pretending like I was rich. <laughs> like, um, but I think that accelerates really with, you know, the expansion of things like Tumblr and, Instagram, where suddenly there are these visual representations of that community and people sharing from this sort of like quasi quasi public, quasi private space. And that is what really actually kind of pushed me into um, into organizing was, I think, and this also has to do with the ubiquity of access um, or lowering access to joining the sex work community and not necessarily being identified as a sex worker. Um, suddenly there was a bunch of people that I could speak to in an anonymous way about my experiences and have affirmation and just having that kind of, uh, and this is something that I wasn't really able to access until visual culture came into the reality of sex work, especially with Tumblr, um, as we were talking a little bit about earlier. 
And having that space to be able to express my experience and converse about it with others without necessarily having to um, really take over the persona was the thing that really elevated me toward wanting to be more vocal about it. So it's really this kind of double-edged sword where there is so much room for new people uh, to become involved, but because of that kind of like influx, there's also this like new, like, all right, like going back to like when regulation occurs, there's suddenly a resistance and a self-governance that occurs within sex work. So like thinking about the response to um, condom regulation and porn and the response being like, well, we have self-governance. We have all of these like motions in place to keep ourselves safe that you don't understand because you're not part of the industry, even that explodes. So with the lower barrier of entry to sex work um, or to any sort of trade of sex work, suddenly people were more exposed to regulation. And when regulation dropped, the, the movement work exploded. And that's like the weird um, dichotomy or like the dualism of this like exposure, participation, and reaction resistance that I think is like really just, um, I don't know, makes me feel at home. Um, that's such a beautiful framing, kind of drawing on that. And you know, one of the things that I, I feel like uh, we share is that experience of trading sex, doing it without a name, doing it without understanding that, you know, it's that you're not going to get HIV, like that's not what's going to happen to you, that you don't have to anticipate violence and that violence isn't part of the job. And already doing that and then finding sex work community and figuring out what safety means, figuring out harm reduction and being politicized around this identity. And then of course, everyone accidentally becoming an organizer is like, it feels, that feels like a, a shared trajectory. Um, and so, you know, thinking about, especially what you were just saying about media and personas is something that definitely came up that under, with social media, with the advancement of technology, the development of a persona and, and having to brand all of a sudden really became a thing. And so I would love for you guys to talk about, you know, and, and as you were just saying, like there, all of a sudden there's more representation and there's more representation among these media narratives that look a thousand different ways and, and they influence so many people. And one of the things that was really unique about Backpage was that it did incorporate sex work into this very normalized world. And then that brought regulation. And so I'm curious if you guys um, can talk a little bit about what is this double-edged sword of like higher visibility bringing in regulation and what that does. And especially when the higher visibility is often something that is navigated Sometimes it's for other community members. Sometimes it's anonymous tumblers, but the vast majority of, of what is seen and what becomes hyper visible are personas that are geared towards clients. And so there are these stories where, you, or these, there are so many representations of people pretending to live lives that they actually don't and pretending to not experience violence or complication because the personas that get most proliferated are the ones that have to be put out as much as possible to as many clients as possible. And the quieter ones, the secret ones, the more painful ones are the honest representations. And so as we do get these higher representations of media narratives that are filtered through these very different experiences, I would love to hear you guys talk a little bit about kind of what that double-edged sword is, especially as the barriers are really low when these new folks are coming in, having quite possibly only seen um, the personas that are put out really for clients. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, again, this is such a huge and complicated uh, conversation. Something just like immediately, I think a piece of reading that everyone should do is Tina Horn's essay about the uh, sort of unpaid work of Twitter persona when you are a sex worker. I can't remember what it's called, but it is in uh, the, what's it called? The Establishment Magazine, RIP. Um, oh, thank you, Blint. <laughs> um, and yes, the class drag of sex work. This is something that I have thought about so much, which is how, I mean, this the, the class drag of sex work predates the internet, 
for sure. Like I used to always pretend to clients that I was in college and they would be like, oh, you're going home to visit your family for the, you know, whatever holiday. And you're, I'm giving you money towards your tuition. Like, I think I probably even in one of my early ads put like student, I built, I always put student, like people love student, whatever. It's like such a, I don't know. It is such a virginal, <laughs> rich, you know, um, I, icon or whatever. Um, and yeah, the thing that I've thought about a lot is how you're supposed to pretend, and Blunt's making me laugh, um, you're supposed to pretend that you are the kind of person, in order to make the most money selling sex, you're supposed to pretend that you're the kind of person who would never sell sex. Um, and that has both moral implications and class implications. Um, and the online persona piece of it is just even more complicated. I, so there's so many ways that I, directions I wanna go, but I'll just tell you a little bit. One is that uh, just a, of the narrative is that when I first was working in Los Angeles, this was around 2005, 2006, uh, 2007, uh, I, my agent used to make me post on the internet because that was the way that you get fans to be fans and to you had to be a person uh, in addition to being a performer, <laughs> like a person uh, in the so I was so he made me post like once a week in the chat on adultdvdtalk.com. Um, and I don't even know what I posted some bullshit. Uh, and I was like so scared. It was like, I don't want something to be recorded forever on about me, you know? And that just so dramatically changed within the next couple of years where it actually became really just so advantageous. Like before that, okay, so my agent would, and I think this is important too when we're talking about organizing and connecting with community and also working conditions, which is that it, this double-edged sword is also about working conditions. So like one of the reasons I had an agent was that you couldn't work in LA at that time without having some dude who would take you to sets and to, you know introduce you to directors um, who would then hire you. And that was sort of how you got hired. Uh, you know, we called them go-sees. Um, and then in after 2008, when everybody had Twitter profiles, I remember somebody, I've told this story before, but somebody um, was doing an article about like Twitter is the LinkedIn of sex work. And they interviewed me and they asked me what I thought of this comparison. And I said, what is LinkedIn? Uh, because Twitter was where we got work like that. Why, why don't you, why would I have some other profile? So, you know, that really changed. And what that one of the things that that changed was our ability to in, work independently, to work without a manager. Um, another thing that that changed uh, because we could re reach out directly to clients um, and also because we could, you know, do doubles with some other other worker who we were meeting um, online, for example. Um, but then another uh, thing that that changed was the ability to, especially in pornography, was how prior to this, there was sort of, I think, a denial of the fact that there's an audience for every single person being naked. Like, yes, um, you know, white supremacy exists in, in pornography and it exists in media and it exists in consumption, absolutely. And I am not saying that that's not true and sizeism exists and all of these, um, you know, forms of uh, stigma exist in our consumption habits. However, there is a much bigger audience than directors formerly in the studio system were willing to admit. There's a much bigger variety of what people find sexy than directors who were who didn't have data, you know, they just had tradition. And like not that data is not steeped in, you know, white supremacist algorithms anyway. But <laughs> so there was that's also part of what I'm talking about with the double-edged sword, because um you had then also the increased visibility where before you might have your manager only who knows who you are and knows 
you know, and is taking you around. And so you have a limited group of people who know that you're doing sex work. Um, and you can really have compartmentalization, not perfect compartmentalization ever, because, you know, no matter what kind of sex work you're doing, there's always the overlap where somebody comes in to the house that you're working out of as your client. And you're like, oh shit, this is the TA from my class at San Francisco State, true story. Uh, or, you know, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, can't, I won't go into all the true stories. Um, but now that you're online, it's much, much more likely that you're going to be recognized. Your sex worker persona is going to be found. And so, you know, we have this, these sort of protective measures of not showing your face, um, but still that risk is higher. Um, and wait, I forgot what the question was. It's about visibility, the double-edged sort of visibility. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, another uh, part of it that I also uh, wanted to mention is that for myself, as someone who is an activist organizer and sex worker, like combining those personas over the years became necessary for me using my online platforms because I tried at first, I had a sex work Twitter and a regular Twitter regular. It's so wild how you just, you know, get this language in your head. Um, but I had a sex work Twitter and a non-sex work Twitter because some family members started following me on my sex work Twitter. Uh, so then I was like, this is no longer a sex work Twitter. Now I have another sex work Twitter. <laughs> and I stopped posting sex works, like pictures and like, you know, et cetera. Um, but it didn't really work out because then my sex work Twitter would always be the one that had the most followers. And so then when I wanted to reach a lot of people in order to do organizing, and I know I'm not alone in this, I've talked to other sex workers where this happens, you need, you're like, my friends are dying. I need to reach as many people as possible. So I'm going to post to everywhere. And that not only increases like the number of people who know where you're vulnerable. Like if you start talking about violence at work online, clients who want to be violent know how to do it because you told that story. If you start talking about screening and safety measures, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether we should pub make pub blacklist public, for example, you know, because then the person who's blacklisted knows the name they're blacklisted under, the number they're blacklisted under, they know how to change all of that information. But then if you don't make them public, then folk, sex workers who are isolated don't have access to that information. So it is, it is a constant, um, um, like a like a just treacherous walk of this line between um, the violence of visibility and the violence of invisibility, and I haven't found a way around that. You know, all we do is we keep strategizing and we keep doing what we can. I mean, we make and I think for a lot of us, the risk assessment changes day to day, depending on what we need that day. So I'll stop there. Totally. Yeah. Um, facing, I feel like I'm facing that like right now. And I think that that really the, the part of like really having to use the civilian side to reach more people is so incredibly important. Like, you know, having a side of the self that is tailored toward um, the community and clientele also is just preaching to the audience. Right. And so like, we're kind of in this space of um, like someone I love is a sex worker, you know, <laughs> Instagram posts of being like, well, like, what is that medium? And like, how much do I have to expose myself in order to make people care because they've already, for instance, quote, loved me for other reasons. Um, and it, it's just really just something I think that this double-edged sword is something that is, uh, like that's almost the good, the, the positive side of the double-edged sword of the lower barrier to entry in sex work, that because there's been this kind of conflation of like, sort of like just not even like just going forth in a, like a neoliberal uh, liberation <laughs> motif of, of why I entered sex work, because I'm a woman, because I, I wanna 
be able to make money outside of the constructs of like normativity, like that, like that is just like the most privileged discussion around sex work, but that has weirdly in the positive sense opened up this kind of um, understanding that yeah, your next door neighbor might be a sex worker, like your, your local academic might be a sex worker. Um, and I really do think that, that it, it kind of, there, there is this moment that occurs where like with iPhones and like with the corporatization of the internet, like this walled garden entry, um, walled gardens being um, a closed ecosystem in which like all experience is um, basically controlled by an entity. So Facebook, Google, like Apple, like those are all walled gardens. And then at the same time, there is this the financial crisis of 2008. And there's nothing like a, uh, a crisis of globalization to make sex work incredibly visible. So, you know, the financial crisis plus walled gardens and platforming creates seeking arrangement. And suddenly you have this whole student narrative of like, oh my God, I'm about to graduate and I have like $80,000 in student debt and like wink, wink, nod, like this is not sex work has immediately convoluted the, um, the sort of hard barrier of it not being like that happens elsewhere. And that just increases um, as time goes on really to kind of include like these other voices that really um, both come, like I said, from this like weird neoliberal, I don't have to participate in capitalism the correct way, but like still capitalism is my way to freedom. Um, but because of that really opened the expansion of the conversation. And, and it's just something that's really frustrating in all like feminist liberation work where it takes like the mainstreaming of a marginalized uh, community in order to um, really come forward and talk about new ideas of society. So the other side of that, you know, is like we, are getting to use this as an abolitionist um, mindset. We are being able to have a space to recognize that the beginnings of a, like sex work organizing do come from black and brown experiences. And like, these are things that were very unfortunately ignored in a lot of like, I'll say uh, intermediate organizing where it was just like, well, I'm smart and I get to do sex work and like I'm a student has now like actually opened backwards in a weird way to like recognize the true history, the deleted history of, of just um, not only surviving capitalism, but also moving forward into future ideas of what autonomy can look like. That's such a beautiful framing. Um, and so what we're going to do right now is I'm going to really quickly go through the resources um, because we're at that final half hour point where we're going to stop recording and um, open it up for a conversation for folks to connect. But I'm going to ask a question right now before I go to resources because I'm going to put it to our two panelists in the non-recorded section first. But um, and I'll, so I'll give you a moment to think about it because I just thought about it now, especially after these last beautiful comments is, all right, so we're here and we're facing a moment where regulation is coming down. There's so many things being debated in Congress and some of them look exactly like fossa sesta Some of them look very different. Um, some of them are administrative and gonna move faster. And we're also in this moment where I think a lot of folks are not necessarily like 230 purists. We recognize that the way that Facebook has been navigating has created and and fueled and fostered QAnon and uh, racial hatred and uh, genocides in different countries. And we recognize that there does need to be something different and, you know, don't at the same time want to be the sacrificial lamb that keeps happening where you kick out the sex workers and so you've dealt with the problem. And that's really the way for the problem to perpetuate. So my question, and before we go to resources, uh, to give you guys a minute to think about it, is uh, Gabriella and Lorelai, I would love for you guys to start us off on a conversation of, okay, we're here. How do we move forward? Is 
good regulation possible in this moment? And maybe yes, maybe no, but how do we take this next step to maintain our community, maintain our dialogue, maintain our safety? At, and at the same time, recognizing that we are on the precipice of what could be a very different moment in this form of digital regulation and digital gentrification that we've been experiencing for the last 15, 20 years. Um, so I'll give you guys a minute um, to think on that one. So if you could solve all our problems, that would be cool. Um, and our resources, and we'll be sending these out. Also, if you guys have not seen this image, it's one of my favorites on the internet. I don't know if anyone saw the initial Real Men Don't Buy Girls uh, PSAs that were put out, but I think this is the initial don't hold up a sign and not expect the internet to fuck with you. Um, and so this has been one of my favorite things in the history of anti-trafficking movements is this picture. Um, but the resources that we're gonna be sending out is, uh, one is a link to the PSA that uh, Seth Meyers, Amy Schumer, and a number of different celebrities put out with clearly no understanding of what SESTA was or did or any of the underlying issues, but was really um, part of a very celebrity fueled movement to pass this legislation. Um, after that, we have two pieces from Tits and Sass, which if you aren't familiar with Tits and Sass, it is a wealth of brilliance and beauty and community and, uh, and some of the most thoughtful uh, writing on sex work that you're going to find on the internet. Um, so it, first on the death of Backpage and then talking about being working class after Backpage, which, um, you know, we have not talked a lot about uh, the digital stratification that fuels um, class and equity. Um, and, and this piece really kind of dives into it. Next is Erase the Impact of FOSTA SESTA, um, which is a report put out by Hacking Hustling, has some fabulous information. Um, we were going to link to some Twitter threads, but actually... Uh, the hashtag let us survive or hashtag survivors against SESTA um, was one of the really important tools of organizing in 2018 and actually is still used um, as an organizing tool today. Um, and so we encourage folks to, to just dig into some of uh, those, uh, those hashtags, which, um, you know, were created in a moment of confusion and panic and trying to figure out how to do organizing on the internet and a really in, in terms of federal legislation. Um, and then uh, FOSTA in a legal context, Lorelai mentioned, is a, a really phenomenal piece um, about uh, the passage of FOSTA-SESTA, um, looking at it through uh, that lens. And so we are going to stop recording, um, and we encourage folks to uh, 